Hello, Hosanna. Hopefully you can see me this week. Last week, I know that the, I was wearing my cloak of invisibility. Uh, now I've been trying different machines and I know you weren't able to see me, which didn't disappoint me at all. But uh, uh, I wish I could see you. That's the main thing. Uh, we, we really miss being able to see you. Yep. And to see your faces. And I'm sure our faces have had all sorts of different kinds of expressions on them through this. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a moment. Have you ever had a look on your face of utter bewilderment? A look that maybe suggests that your, your senses are perceiving something, but your mind isn't quite comprehending what's going on. And that uh, there's one possibility for what that could look like. <laughs> maybe even your body doesn't know what to do in that moment. Well, the people who encountered Jesus for the first time after his resurrection would have reacted just like that. What the heck is going on? This was something completely new, something they have never even imagined was possible. But here he is. Mm -hmm. Now they have to deal with that incredible, and the word literally means unbelievable, new reality. And maybe their reaction, a little bit more intense probably, and a little bit more momentary, is similar in some respects to the bewilderment that many of us have felt over the past 40 days or so. Mm -hmm. Similar enough for us to invite them to help us process our own reactions. I mean, think about it. If somebody had told us in January 1 that we'd be where we are here at the beginning of May, that we'd be largely confined to our homes, <laughs> we'd be wearing masks, our businesses would be shut down, that we wouldn't even be meeting for church, whoever would have thought of that. We'd have laughed them off. But here we are, rightly or wrongly, for a little while longer, or maybe a lot longer, who knows? Yeah. Well, what we've been trying to say all along is what an opportunity this is. We said last week that Jesus' earliest friends were transformed after his resurrection in the same way that we too are transformed. And here we are, given the chance to feel just a bit of what they felt. Yeah. Given the chance to know the same risen Jesus. Given the chance to be transformed in this moment, in this experience. Let's not waste it. Let's not waste either the pain or the gifts of what we're going through right now. And that's why our theme for the whole month of May is to follow them in their transformation. And so to be changed ourselves. So, well, how does that happen? How are we transformed in moments like that? It doesn't just happen. It's not just going through the experience. It's going to do it all by itself. But it's not entirely our work either. It's God's. It's yeah. a partnership, actually. And our part is to pay attention to what God is inviting us into and then to respond. So last week, we explored the good news that Jesus comforts. He invites us into that, particularly in our moments of bewilderment. Jesus gives us what we need in those moments so we can move on in the process of transformation. Yes, that's true. And as we're comforted by Jesus and given some time to feel safe and grounded, Jesus offers us an initial response to the question um, asked by, I think, any disciple of Jesus confronted with the resurrection. That question that we all ask um, who have authentically engaged Jesus' resurrection. The question is, how can this be? This is a movement in the transformation process in which Jesus clarifies, or at least he begins to clarify. Mm -hmm. That's because at this point in the process, although some of the fear and bewilderment is starting to settle down, the mind is still reeling and not thinking logically. I mean, how could it be? Resurrection makes no logical sense. It challenges one of the undisputed facts about the way things work. People are born, they live for a time, and then they die and stay dead. Fact. Never had been any other way. Jesus, yeah, he had amazed people by raising Lazarus and others from death, but they weren't resurrected. He raised them to life, but their bodies would once again die and decay. Jesus' resurrection was a whole new thing, which made absolutely no sense. And yes, it needed to be clarified a bit um, so that those first disciples could accept its reality and then move on into the rest of the transformation process. So what does it mean that Jesus clarifies? Well, as we just noticed, the heads of those who witnessed the risen Jesus 
were still a bit addled by the whole experience. They were unable to consider what was happening logically. So Jesus, he doesn't appeal first to their heads. He does not give them a Resurrection 101 lecture and sit them down and hand out the accompanying workbook so they can <laughs> fill in the blanks with all the pre precise definitions and theological concepts of resurrection. A time will come um, for that head understanding for those first disciples. But, but at this point in the process, Jesus is less focused on the way the head knows. And he's more focused on the way the heart knows. Um, yeah, because the head knows in ways the heart doesn't, but the heart knows in ways that the head can't. See, Jesus offers his first disciples grace that reveals down to the core of, of, of their being what is really real. And he's revealing this to them, especially at a time when there just were no words to describe it or explain it yet. It's brand new, just happened. So Jesus clarifies by, by giving them and giving us too the grace to know deep down in our knower what is really real. And we see this movement of, of clarifying, particularly in three stories of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. The first of these encounters occurred the day of the resurrection. Two disciples, one of them named Clopas, the other is unnamed, perhaps his wife, they had heard of the story. They probably heard directly from Mary of meeting Jesus in the garden that morning, outside the tomb. But they didn't know what to make of it. It wasn't enough. It was just a story. It wasn't enough to keep them in Jerusalem. They were going home to Emmaus, not too far, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. It was the day after the Sabbath, the Sabbath after Passover, and the road was busy that day, and surely. And in a culture where everybody walked or rode, where even short distances took some time, it was common to strike up conversations with strangers on the road. And that's what happened on this day. Someone heading in the same direction came up to them and said, in essence, we're paraphrasing here now, hey guys, what's up? <laughs> and their response was, what's up? <laughs> Are you the only person on this road who is not talking about what happened over the weekend? And then they explained to him who Jesus was and what had happened over the weekend. And then the stranger surprised them by explaining to them even more about who Jesus was. He clarified for them that Jesus was the one who had been promised and had done what was promised. Mm -hmm. It must have been amazing. And to our regret, they didn't even write it down. <laughs> Why didn't they? Probably because their right. minds were not yet comprehending all of this. Not yet. No. Another part of them was reacting, however. Later that evening, they looked at each other and they asked each other this question. Were our heart, not our hearts burning within us? while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us, yeah. our hearts burning. Yeah. Well, one of the great revival leaders of church history, John Wesley, you may have heard of him, used a similar phrase when describing the moment that he received the clarity that he needed. Now, he had the head stuff. He had a master's degree from Oxford University. He was an ordained priest. He even had been a missionary. But he did not have the confidence in his faith that many of you have. So he prayed for it. And one night in a Bible study, he said his heart was strangely warmed. He said, I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me. Yes. See, it was not his mind that needed to be warmed. It was his heart. Yes. And why is that? Because it is with our heart that we truly, deeply trust. Yes. Well, the heartwarming of those two disciples on the road turned to that kind of assurance later that evening. When they invited that stranger to share dinner with them. And the story says that when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. Does this sound familiar? It did to them. And he gave it to them and their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. That was their moment of clarity. He did what he had done three, just three nights before. They had not understand, understood fully then. But now they could, at least with their hearts. His body had been broken for them like the bread, but now it was restored. And this was their friend Jesus smiling at them across the table. 
may be just like he smiles at you and me when our own eyes and heart are open to what is really real. Yes. Oh, I love that story. And our second story is actually an extension of that story, the first one. So there they were. They recognized Jesus. He smiles probably, and then poof, he disappears. And they did, I think, what any two of us sitting there would do. They looked at each other, probably smiled at each other, and immediately ran back to Jerusalem as fast as they could to tell the rest of the disciples what they'd experienced. And when they got there, they found all the disciples were gathered together, celebrating that Jesus was alive because of all the reports of his appearances that just kept filtering back to them. And here were the two from Emmaus, and they said, us too, they added their their experience. And as they were all talking, <laughs> Jesus showed up for the party. He just appeared right there in the midst of them. And his friends were all standing there with their jaws um, like gaping wide open. So Jesus takes the opportunity to offer them some more clarification. Let's read a bit of the story from Luke 24. Standing there among them, he said, be at peace. I am the living God. Don't be afraid. Why would you be so frightened? Don't let doubt or fear enter your hearts. Again, don't let it enter your hearts, for I am. Come and gaze upon my pierced hands and feet. See for yourselves. It is I standing here alive. Touch me. Okay, are you noticing that Jesus keeps inviting them to use their physical senses to validate reality? He say, see and touch. And then he goes on and no, this is not a Greek word that is a word indicating head knowing. This is the Greek word Ido and it means to physically see something, like to know it by seeing it with your own eyes. So he say, so Jesus says, touch me and know that my wounds are real. Then he says it again. You can tell he's talking to people who are just not able to comprehend. He just keeps repeating it. So he says, see, and literally that word in Greek is a word that means discern this, acknowledge this through your own experience. It's just an experiential knowing word. See that I have a body of flesh and bone. And again, this is reminding us of, of yet another post-resurrection appearance story with Thomas, in which he, Thomas was invited to touch him. Here, he's inviting the whole group. See that I have a body of flesh and bone. He showed them his pierced hands and feet and let them touch his wounds. The disciples were ecstatic yet dumbfounded. Bewildered. Okay. Fully comprehended. I've been ecstatic and dumbfounded so many times in my life. Have you, Tony? Yes. <laughs> Particularly of late. <laughs> and I'm rarely able to comprehend anything fully, especially the older I get. Anyway, I think it's obvious from this passage so far in this story, Jesus isn't talking to their heads. It was what was what Tony was saying earlier. What he's needing to do is first feed much needed information to their bodies and to their hearts. But even as they are touching him, they still aren't able to believe their own senses. So Jesus goes yet another step and he asks them to feed him. They give him some fish and some honeycomb and there he is. And as he's chewing and swallowing, he's clarifying for them in a similar way that he did for the, the two Emmaus disciples. See, they're all eating together. And then he goes on in Luke 24 and he says, don't you remember the words that I spoke to you when I was still with you? I told you that everything written about me would be fulfilled, including all the prop prophecies from the law of Moses through the Psalms and the writings of the prophets, that they would all find their fulfillment he supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of the scriptures. Wow, there is a lot in that sentence and a lot in that movement. It is so cool. Literally, in Greek, it says that Jesus 
up through opened their minds. He up through opened their minds. He supernaturally opened what they'd been seeing and feeling and experiencing down in their bodies and in their hearts. He supernaturally opened all of that way of knowing, that knowledge of re that resurrection reality. He opened it up into their minds. It says that he, he up through opened their minds to understand. But again, there are words in Greek that mean head understanding. That's not this. He allowed all of that to come up into their minds to understand, not in a head rational way. See, that word in Greek for understand, it's a word that means to bring together in union in the present moment. It's just like all of that knowing of the body, all of that knowing of the heart, all of the knowing of the remembering, all of it. In a moment, Jesus allows it to just whoosh, go up and come together with their minds. And that's what's being brought together here. You see, it appears that Jesus is supernaturally bringing together as one in that moment the disciples' physical experience and deep heart knowing and empowering their minds to receive reality that the human mind cannot comprehend on its own. You know what this is called? This is called revelation. This is the process that God uses to reveal, or one of them, to reveal to us what our minds, it's beyond our mind, what only God can know. As, um, as we were working on the message earlier, oh, I saw in my mind the, it, I guess it was a revelation, that scene from The Miracle Worker, the movie The Miracle Worker. And if you wanna watch it now, we're gonna invite you to just stop the recording here, go back to the web page, the, click on the link, and you can watch the clip there and then come back here when you're done. Or you can watch it later and I'll describe it here. Anyway, there's that scene um, in The Miracle Worker where the exhausted teacher, Annie Sullivan, is feeling like an utter failure. <clears throat> She's just had enough of blind, deaf, spoiled little Helen Keller. She takes, she's been trying to teach her how to communicate, how to understand language, how to understand words. And it's just not connecting. So she, she's so frustrated. She takes Helen in one hand at this point and, and a pitcher, a water pitcher in the other hand, and they head out to the water pump. And she wants Helen to pump water into the pitcher, but Helen refuses to do it. So Annie does it. The water comes gushing out of the pump and Annie, she takes Helen's hand and she puts it down in the flow of water and she starts signing into her hand, W-A-T-E-R, into the palm of her hand. And she's doing it again, W-A-T-E-R, and doing it again. She's clarifying again and again. Nothing's ever happened before, but in this moment, Helen changes completely. She grabs Annie's hand, she puts her hand under the water, and she signs into Annie's hand, W-A-T-E-R. Annie takes Helen's hands and holds them up to her face and nods, yes. And then Helen falls on the ground. This is powerful to me. She falls on the ground and she's just hitting the ground with her hands. And she's saying to tell her what that is. And Annie goes over and signal and um, signs to her, G-R-O-U-N, ground. Ground, yes, yes. Tree, tree, yes. Bell, yes. Mother, yes. And finally, she, something connected within her in a way that no human being can make it connect. And she knows a reality that is real beyond her physical senses. And in that moment, she is finally able to know who Annie is. She goes to Annie and she takes her hand. 
She's like, who are you? And Annie signs into her hand, teacher. See, Annie is such a beautiful picture of our teacher, Jesus, and the way that he patiently clarifies for us until just over and repeats over and over until we, like Helen, can experience those revelatory moments when it all comes together as one inside of us. And we know that we know what is real beyond anything that we really can know. And, and we are completely changed by that knowing and everything is completely changed by that knowing and there's no going back to what was and there's no desire to go back to what was. See, what we can be and what the world is asking for right now are Christians who don't just talk about the resurrection. We can be, and the world needs right now, Christians who have actually experienced the reality of the resurrection for themselves. Christians who've been so changed and so humbled by the revelation that their puny human minds have acknowledged their limits and have bowed down before the only all-knowing one. See, only then is anyone able to truly understand or interpret the scriptures at all. And only then is any human being ever safe to interpret the scriptures at all. Mm. Well, we said there are three stories. Yeah. We've done two that occurred on the way to Emmaus and then on the way back in Jerusalem. We have a third one yet. The third story occurred sometime later when the immediate shock of the resurrection had worn off a bit. And the disciples were beginning to adjust to this new reality, however bewildering it remained to them. And like Helen Keller now knew what the name of that sensation of cool waters on her, on her fingers was. And she could build on that revelation to experience new things. So the disciples now knew that their friend was alive and they were building on that revelation to experience even more of this fresh reality that had appeared to them. It was still confusing in many ways. Jesus was alive again, but things weren't the way they were before. Jesus' body looked like his old one, but was somehow different. Jesus was with them, at least from time to time, but not all the time, and he talked about going away. Their minds did not yet all comprehend it. He had told the 12 to go back to Galilee, so they did. He said, I'll meet you there, but what to do when they're hanging out waiting for Jesus? Most of them were fishermen, so they went fishing. <laughs> These guys never seem to have a good experience fishing in the Gospels. Either a big storm comes up in the middle of the night and Jesus has to rescue them, or they turn out to be pretty lousy fishermen, despite being professionals. And this is one of those nights. There's seven of them and no fish all night. The next morning at dawn, they see a guy on shore, too far away to see his face, but close enough to yell back and forth. And they yelled, and he yelled out, Hey guys, throw your net onto the water on the other side of the boat. Stupid advice. It's the same water. Both fish and water move. But for some reason, fatigue maybe, or just perhaps instinct, they do it. And suddenly their neck gets really, really heavy. And then at that moment, one of the disciples gets some instant clarity. Mm -hmm. They've done this before. <laughs> Jesus had told them one other time, it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, put your net down on the other side, and just like now, they caught more fish than they could handle. And so this is recorded. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved uh, said to Peter, it's the Lord. It's Jesus. Don't you see, Peter? And Peter does see. He has his own moment of clarity then when his friend says it and his heart responds before his mind does and he does something that's also a little bit stupid. He jumps into the water and he swims to shore. He's so much in a rush to see Jesus again. Yeah. And when they finally get the boat on shore and all that fish, fish pulled up, however, they're not this time. Some weeks later standing with their mouths agape in utter confusion. Wow, he's alive. No, what, what do they do? They count fish. <laughs> As if the very numbering of them, because it's recorded, 153 fish, it's recorded in scripture for some reason. As if that very numbering tells us something important about how they're processing things now. 
And John tells us why. They are processing a little differently. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Why? They didn't need to ask. They knew. They knew it was the Lord. And it's that same word that Joanne introduced to us earlier, to know with the senses. It means to perceive or to see what has been revealed to, the, to, to us. Well, Jesus had been revealing God and God's ways all along. That's what he came to do. He was revealing God in his incarnation. He did that through his parables, through his miracles, in his dying, and in his rising. And he's still doing it. Yeah. Showing them in his own resurrected life the new realities of the kingdom of God. And they're finally understanding that a little bit, at least in one part of them. And they actually begin to relax a bit with him now. They're counting fish. They're eating breakfast. He had caught fish, by the way, even though they couldn't. They're chatting by the seashore. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus' clarifying process, they're gradually trusting, maybe even enjoying this new life. And they find the longer they go into it, they certainly don't want to go back to life as it used to be. Something new has emerged, and it is glorious, and it's there in front of them. You see, this was the third time, at least, that Jesus had appeared to them. They'd experienced his comfort, and they had come to the confidence, although that they were in a radically transformed place with no idea where this was going or what would be happening next, so they could trust him. And as they adjusted more and more, that they could even have faith and trust his process. Yeah. And of course, you know where this is going. They could, and so can we. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Yes. So here's the invitation to settle into the now and trust that when we need to know more, he will show us and he will tell us. Jesus is pretty good at show and tell. He will clarify. Yes. So, well, how does that look for us in real life, in practical terms? What can we do to respond to and receive the clarity that Jesus is offering all of us in our time of bewilderment and confusion? Well, these three stories give us some simple practical ideas for that. So first, let's look to the past and then lean into memory. Now, now notice what happened in these stories. The first two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they recognized Jesus when he broke bread with them again. Mm -hmm. The disciples on the boat recognized Jesus when he filled their nets with fish again, <laughs> revisiting those former experiences. And in their case, even reliving them provided the clarity that they needed in that moment. And that, that seems true for us. Our memories with Jesus can likewise become real again for us, particularly in moments when we are feeling a bit bewildered. We can revisit them prayerfully in our imagination. Yeah. So think for a moment, was there a time when your own heart was strangely warmed? Was there an experience with God that changed your life, set you on a new path, clarified things for you in a way that really made a difference? Mm -hmm. Stop and revisit that moment. Maybe even pause and revisit that moment right now. Allow yourself to feel again what you felt then. Mm -hmm. Ask Jesus to help you know a bit of the clarity that you experienced in that moment, however long ago it was. Do what Mary, the mother of Jesus, did when he was born and treasure that memory and ponder it in your heart even more than in your mind. Yeah. Allow yourself to know down here, particularly now in this season of stress and bewilderment, what your yeah. heart knew then. Yeah. Tony. Yes. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking of an example. My memory is, my body's triggering my memory. Uh, I took voice lessons for a long time. I used to actually sing on the worship team for years. And the, it, my voice teacher taught me about muscle memory, which basically she said, because I, I was always afraid because I get so nervous. I was so afraid I would forget the lyrics to a song, you know. And she said, don't ever worry about that. As long as you practice and breathe, your, the muscles in your body remember and if you f if your mind forgets a word your body will automatically start to breathe correctly and your lips will start to form the next word oh my gosh it was true it was true the lips begin to form the words and it just gives enough time for the mind to come back in again 
So maybe this is a kind of spiritual muscle memory too. That is awesome. Yeah. Some people do this rather intentionally on a regular basis. I know I have one of those experiences. Um, I had what I call my epiphany on epiphany. There's a 12 days after Christmas is Epiphany Sunday. And uh, there was one back uh, seven years ago that just that changed the way I looked at my past. And every year on that date, I go yeah. back and revisit that experience. And it helps me remember what is true. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're encouraging you to do. And by the way, if you're listening to this and you're saying, wow, I don't think I've ever had one of those clarifying moments. Yeah. I've never experienced the reality of Jesus' presence in a way that warmed my heart and, uh, and allowed me to see him the way you guys are talking about it and, and ask him for it. Pause right now. Yeah. Ask him right now. It's a yeah. gift he, uh, he loves to give. Yeah, so practically, what does this clarifying mean for us? It means we can look to the past and lean into the memory and trust that Jesus clarifies that way. That leads to the second practical idea, which is stay aware in the present and discern your daily experience, right? So again, although we can't see the risen Jesus with our physical eyes at this time in history, like, like they could back then immediately after his resurrection, he's still present with us. No matter where we are or what we're doing, whether we're working or eating, hiking or binge watching historical documentaries, <laughs> oop, I gave myself away of what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm jealous. Stay at home. <laughs> um, whether we're alone or six feet apart in community, no matter what we're feeling, you know, even when we're bewildered, even when our minds are trying desperately to figure out what's real and, and what it all means. Like, the disciples in the first days and weeks following the resurrection, Jesus is there, Jesus is here, and he's still clarifying in so many different ways. If only we'll pay attention. The Celtic Christian tradition says that we fail to see Christ, not because he is absent, but because we are blind. And that doesn't mean blind physically as much as it may mean just not paying attention Spiritually, not opening our eyes and actually idoing, perceiving, seeing. But for those with eyes to see and ears to hear, nothing is ordinary. God is using everything in our lives, both inside us and outside and all around us, to, to reveal himself to us. He does this gently and continually. He invites us to notice and experience Jesus' presence through our circumstances and our relationships, our physical senses, our emotions, our desires, those thoughts that are just too good to be ours, even though we want to claim that they are. Um, just as those first disciples, they needed visible, tangible reality in order to be able to be anchored down, to connect to invisible spiritual reality. So do we, we're just as human as they were. And God's spirit offers this to us all the time. You know, that experience of one particular bird singing outside your window that suddenly causes your spirit to rise. And no, this is more than just a bird singing. You know, that experience of longing to talk to a friend and then calling that friend to discover that that friend desperately needed to hear from you. Your mind didn't know that. You know, that aha experience, you know, whether it's a large or small aha experience, those moments where you know that your mind alone could never have put all of that information together that way. Or what about that dream in which your long past grandmother appears to you so young and so alive and so very real? See, the, in these and countless other ways, the risen Christ invites you to pay attention, to trust that he is present and he is wanting to teach you how to discern what is real from what isn't. So you can do what Tony was saying earlier. So you can simply enjoy being alive with him in this wonderful world. Indeed. So we lean into the past. We stay aware in the present. And then we can trust for the future. And relax. Really. 
You're saying that a lot tonight, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I say that tonight. I don't, I haven't practiced that um, all week long necessarily. God may be speaking to you. <laughs> None of those disciples, if you think about it, knew what the future held for them any more than we do. During those final weeks, Jesus would give them occasional glimpses of what's in story. He talked about ascending. But those glimpses only confirm for them that things are going to be different in ways they could not yet imagine. Yeah. And so we get the sense that after a while, they learned to go with the flow. And it turned out, because we got the rest of their story, that what was in store for them was far better than they could have guessed. Yeah. And believe it or not, the same is true for us. Right now, our reality is still scary, frustrating, stressful, maybe perplexing. The news media is now running stories about how, from now on, everything will be different. <laughs> maybe. They're probably partly right. But well, which maybe, maybe it should be that way every day. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen to us? What's life going to look like a year from now? Yeah. And to be honest, even if we were not here in the middle of all this messiness, we still have the same questions, wouldn't we? Yeah. The truth is, none of us ever knows the future, ever. So we're not going to have that kind of clarity in our life. Yeah. But we can still trust. And we know you all. Many of you do. Yep. We can still be at peace, can't we? And many of you are. We can still know that Jesus is alive, that what we build our lives on is real. And, and so we can have genuine hope, can't we? Indeed, we can hope in what no eye has seen, and what no ear has heard, and the, what, what no mind has conceived. Yes. What God has prepared for those who love him. So, why don't we do that? And now might be a good time to give up some habits that keep us from that, from that peace and that hope and that joy. So let me mention a couple. Let's avoid the temptation to squawk that the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Or on the other end of things, to paint an overly rosy picture that everything's just funky dory that's, that's, in other words, to imagine the worst case scenarios and the best case scenarios because they're rarely ever true. And the problem is if we do that, and I, I speak from personal experience here, we'll start living as if they're true. And um, the worst case scenarios in particular can get us into trouble. They get us, in, they get us into darkness. I know that. But the second, overly rosy scenarios will just lead us to disappointment. Yep. Things will be what they will be. And God will still be God. And yeah. God will still be good. Yes. Yes. Let's also try to avoid the temptation to control things. We can't. If we hadn't figured that out before now, this experience, this spring is surely leading us to that kind of clarity, isn't it? I mean, that's why some of us are feeling so stressed and, and uncomfortable. We cannot control this. We don't have that. Did you ever notice how people like to go on roller coasters so they can be in control of feeling out of control? Yes. <laughs> For three minutes, I want to feel out of control, but only in an environment that I choose. On my own schedule, yeah. And that I know is going to end in three minutes. Right, with my safety harness on. <laughs> uh, what can we con control? We can control our, our expectations. Yeah. And what should I expect? Mm -hmm. Perhaps only this. That Christ is alive in the world and in us and will continue to be. And that he's out working his good purposes and his ways in us and through us and for us. And even though those ways are not known to us and that makes us feel uncomfortable, but we can trust him. We can join this, the disciples on the seashore and, and relax. Really. We can eat our breakfast. Thank God Jesus is alive. And yeah. recover the joy of simply being with him as much as we can. It make, I'm laughing because I'm thinking at least the beach wasn't closed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping Jesus opens the beach for the summer. Anyway, so. And they were probably closer than six feet apart. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, as we now want to draw all of this um, into some kind of a closing Let's remember that at the beginning of these COVID time messages, we talked about Julian of Norwich. Remember her? She was the 14th century anchorite who survived one of the most devastating pandemic times in history. Uh, the Black Plague that decimated half the population of England alone. And during this terrible suffering, 
which, you know, even the greatest minds of their time couldn't explain and couldn't end. Julian and many others were longing for a real personal experience of faith. Nothing made sense anymore. They couldn't figure anything out. So they were open for Jesus to reveal himself in some new ways. And that's what happened through those 16 visions that Jesus gave to Julian, which are now called revelations of divine love. In one of these revelations, um, Jesus tells Julian a very famous line, all, and all is well, and all is well, and all manner of things shall be well, which sounds good on the surface, but you know, Julian did not accept that at first. She argued with God for the following 13 chapters in her writing about how all things could not possibly turn out well. She lays out all the world's suffering and evil before Jesus and then challenges him over and over again to explain how all is or how all could ever be well. I love this woman. I have loved this woman for a long time. I think I am this woman. Anyway, Jesus, <laughs> you could see him smiling. He's smiling all the way through. Um, but he doesn't explain because he knows she could not possibly understand. Her mind is good, but there's a bewilderment in her time, just like there is in ours. And he, he doesn't explain anything to her, but he does assure her that over time, God's love, power, and wisdom will indeed make all things well. And he invites her to trust him he invites her to stop judging life as terrible. That's a big one for us, as it was for them, as I think it may be for every human being. Stop judging that life is terrible. Jesus says, Julian, there's more to see here. If you'll just open your eyes and let yourself see it, he invites her to see reality more fully, to receive the clarity he's always offering. And he's, what's the clarity? Well, for her, some of it was that, yes, although evil exists, the more is that love has overcome it. So ultimately, love is what is really real. Love is what raised Jesus from the dead. Love that has transformed ordinary life, infusing it with grace and goodness. If she'll only open her eyes and see it. Well, you know what? She took him up on that. She did. And she experienced wonder more than she could ask or think. And then, thank you, Lord, she offered the gift of those revelations to the people around her and to her country and eventually to the world and to all of us because they so treasured those visions, that revelation, they saved those pages from the 14th century so that we can have them today. And you know what? I can't help but wonder what revelations of divine love Jesus wants to give to us in our time, for ourselves, for our people, for our church, for our country, for our world. Mm -hmm. Does he, he wants to challenge us to let go of our old judgmental ideas of how terrible life is and how terrible people are and maybe how terrible God is. I mean, what revelations might actually open to us if we would simply pay attention, if we would simply experience Jesus for ourselves in our bodies, in our hearts? beyond our minds, in our memories, all of what we've been talking about practically today. What revelations might Jesus give us if we would embrace the radically different life he's already given us? If only we would just stay with him and know deep down in our knower that all is well. And even as he continues to make all manner of thing well. What gift might we offer our world if we would simply practice resurrection with Jesus every day? Well, 
that's the invitation today for all of us. May we all receive this clarity that only Jesus gives, clarity that our minds know nothing of. And so we leave you with this benediction, this blessing from scripture. Now may God, who is the inspiration and fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and yes. perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his superabundance until you radiate with hope. Amen. May it be so. Amen. Blessings.